Bibles this morning to John chapter 9, and we are going to be reading in verses 13 and following of John chapter 9. John chapter 9, verses 13 and following. They brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Now, it was a Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also were asking him again how he received his sight. And he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes, and he said, he is a prophet. The Jews then did not believe it of him, that he had been blind and had received sight, until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight, and questioned them, saying, is this your son, who you say was born blind? Then how does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed if anyone confessed him to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Thank you, and you may be seated. We spent three weeks now, this being the third week, examining the blindness that is apparent not only in this man, but in those that were trying to understand this great miracle that Christ had performed. The first week we looked at spiritual blindness, last week we looked at mental blindness, and this week we're going to look at spiritual blindness. Now, Clarence Larkin, you may be familiar with him, he's done a lot of work. In fact, he wrote a very fascinating book, one of the more fascinating books I think I have ever read on the scripture that provides commentary. And um, you can argue that Clarence Larkin may not have been the most humble man in the world because of the title of his book. Now listen to this title. The title of his book was The Greatest Book Ever Written on Dispensational Truth. That's the only thing that I don't like about Clarence Larkin, because that title doesn't seem to display the greatest sense of humility, but reading his writings, I never thought of him as a very prideful person except for the title of that book, The Greatest Book Ever Written on Dispensational Truth. Uh, that's certainly up for debate. But he does raise some very interesting points in his book. And one of those is these. He understands... That, that we are complex beings. And Clarence Larkin was by training, not a theologian, he was an engineer, but he was able to kind of collate a great deal of information and put it in very understandable form, uh, as engineers sometimes are able to do. But at any rate, he said this, that, that we gain things into our being through certain gates. And he, he looked at these as primarily being the senses, the eye gate, the nose gate, the, the mouth gate, the the touch gate, the five senses basically, that that's, that's how we get empirical data and that's how we get it into our very being. But then he said it kind of goes through certain filters before it gets to our soul. And if those filters are clogged up, then it really never reaches our soul, our deepest being. In fact, I think if you understand this, when we look at Jesus, we know that he is the greatest psychologist that ever lived. Now listen to me. How do we know that? Jesus more accurately describes the human condition than anyone else. Think of that. He knows more about us. He accurately describes us. He knows who you are. He knows your problems. You know, you have people like Freud come along with all of their ideas. That's garbage compared to Jesus. No one knows you. No one knows your inner being like Jesus does. And there are certain things that keep the message that he wants to give us. For example, as a message comes to our soul, a lot of times it'll try to pass through our flesh. Listen to me. The flesh and the spirit are at war with one another. That message will never touch your soul. 
Now, spiritual blindness is the inability for a person to comprehend the very deepest things. It's an inability to see the spiritual world, and especially, now there's a good side and a bad component, clearly to the spiritual world, we understand that. When I'm talking about the spiritual world ultimately, I'm talking about the ability to see the person of Jesus Christ. Now in the text we have before us this morning, here is Jesus, here is Jesus, and he comes to the religious establishment of the nation of Israel, and they reject him. In fact, there is something very interesting that is said in this passage that just jumps out at you. I want you to listen to this, verse 22. His parents, who were afraid of being kicked out of the synagogue, said, ask him, because the Jews, listen to this, verse 22, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be the Christ, if anyone confessed him to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Now what does 1 John tell us? Anyone that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Now here's Jesus from, he's in the flesh. Okay? If anyone confesses him to be the Christ, he's going to be kicked out of the synagogue. Now what did Jesus say in 1 John 4? Now I realize John is writing, but they're the words of Christ. Okay? Anyone that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, this is the spirit of what? The Antichrist. You see what the religious leaders were saying? Either you show us the spirit of the Antichrist, or we're going to kick you out of the synagogue. Would you rather be kicked out of the synagogue or the church or out of heaven? I think the answer is extremely obvious. Clearly! The Pharisees were spiritually blind. And let me say this, if you don't see Christ, you don't see God. And you have no hope. So let's examine this, and we're going to kind of take this in reverse order. I want us to examine today Spiritual blind from the point of view of what blinds our soul, pride blinding our soul, and then how the flesh blinds us, and ultimately how if we go back to the eye gate, how our eyes are blinded to the truth. But let's begin this. Pride blinds the soul. C.S. Lewis makes a very interesting comment, and if you, if you don't get actually much else out of today's sermon, get this phrase from C.S. Lewis, this quote. C.S. Lewis said that pride is the anti-God state of mind. Let's rephrase that. Pride is the anti-God state of mind. If my heart is filled with pride, I'm not going to hear from God. It is the anti-God, I'm not thinking godly, I'm not thinking the position that I can hear from God. Clearly, I'm not going to go back and, and read all of this again, but clearly the Pharisees had this prideful attitude. In fact, they're going in verse 28 and 29, which we'll look at next week. Uh, they reviled this man that was healed because he kept claiming that Jesus had healed him and that he was a prophet, and Jesus is going to reveal himself much more than that a little further in this passage. But they reviled him, and they said, you are his disciples, but we are the disciples of Moses. In other words, they say, we are better because we have Moses as our teacher, and we know that Jesus, if you go back, what they're saying is we know that Jesus is not from God. In fact, they were accusing Jesus, and this is getting really close to the unpardonable sin, because they're saying of Jesus, what? That it is the spirit of Satan. That's literally when they said the spirit of the Antichrist, they were throwing the spirit of Satan upon him. They are getting extremely close to the unpardonable sin here. In fact, you can argue that they had at least already crossed over the line into a reprobate mind. I think you could say that clearly from the evidence that is here before us. Now think of that. All of this had to do with pride. Pride puts you in an anti-God state of mind. Because God hates the prideful, he gives grace to the humble. 
In fact, if I have one bit of advice from you from the Scripture, if you want to hear from God right now, drop the pride. Let go of it. The only person that knows you better than Christ knows you is Satan. You may think you know yourself. You don't know yourself at all. And I don't say that in a condescending way. I don't say that in a way to, to offend you. But think of it. Satan knows you just like this. You know, he knows that if money is your God, he can dangle a dollar bill in front of your eyes and he can get you to file it wherever you, he wants you to go. I've said this before. But if you want to control a man or a woman, find out what their God is. Everyone's got a God. Everyone's got something they value more than anything else. Find out what a person's God is and you can absolutely control that person. If pleasure is their God, give them pleasure. If money is their God, give them money. If power is their God, give them power. And Satan is full, well, happy to do that. What does it mean to him? He placates you for 50 years, he's got you for eternity. There's only one God that gives you full liberation. Only if Jesus Christ is your God do you have freedom. John 8, 30, 31, 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, I get accused oftentimes of having too much scripture, but I'm going to kind of skip over this. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4 through 6, it says this. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Now think of that. What was the sin that caused Satan to become Satan? Pride. Read Isaiah you know, 12. That great passage there, 12 through 14, explains. Go back into Ezekiel, read those passages. But it's rather fascinating, if there's one person that knows about pride, it is Satan. And he is a master at using it. So, if you can be tempted to be filled up with pride, oh man, just think how easy it is to control you. Just think how easy it is. You know, if, if, if as a fisherman I could use pride for bait, and fish would respond like people, I could fill up the boat just like that. <laughs> Think of it, Andrew. If, you, if we could make that lure, we could be millionaires. But then we'd fall into the temptation of money, wouldn't we? If you ever think about it, you have to be really careful because Satan is really slick. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, sneaks around like a roaring lion. Don't ever think don't ever think that he's telling you when he's coming. The very imagery there is painted of a lion roaring after he's taken his prey. Listen to me. A lion would starve to death if he yelled, if he growled, if he roared before he made the kill. When Satan roars, it is not in advance. It is after the kill after the fall. It is always after the fall. But pride puts us in a position, and think of this, God is not going to reveal himself to someone that's prideful. I want you to think of that. And the other thing is, even if God did reveal himself, I'm in no position to hear from him when I am filled up with pride. You know, the amazing thing about pride, and I'm not a licensed counselor, but I've, you call it counseling, I don't call it counseling, I call it giving biblical advice. I've given a lot of biblical advice over the years to a whole lot of people in a whole lot of settings. And the most amazing thing to me is when someone is filled up with pride, they don't see it. 
It's everybody else in the world's fault. It's as if there's a massive conspiracy and the whole world is out to get me. But somehow, all of the problems, all of the flaws, all of the failures, and the irony is you could ask anybody else in the world that casually knew them, and they would say, yeah, this guy's got a pride problem. I'm not talking about a gossip level. No, just plain not, but it's ironic, isn't it? You ever seen how people will tell you they don't have pride? And then they go to these really long explanations of everybody else's problems, but somehow they are exempt from it. And I'm sitting there going, okay, can we get this over with? Because obviously this is going absolutely nowhere. But there are moments when a person who is dealing with pride, that the spirit begins to try to break through. Now think of it. When I confess that sin, in fact, let me just say this. The closer you draw to the Lord, the more you will hate your own pride. The closer you draw to the Lord, the less you will care what the admission of your sin looks like before the world. You don't care about what other people think. God, search me. Know my inward thoughts. Listen to me. I was recently talking to someone, and I don't think this person wants to listen. I don't think they're in a position to listen, honestly. And I'll say this lightly, but has God ever spoken to your spirit? Now, when usually when he speaks to your spirit, he will give you a message that is for you. Every now and then, God will give you a message that is for someone else. And as I related this, it wasn't received very well, and I'm praying Lord, I'm going to wait. And that's a good thing to do. Those that wait on the Lord will gain new strength. That's not just talking about things that you do. Yeah, that applies to you personally. But in giving advice, because advice can never be in the flesh. It has to be in the spirit. The message that God gave is go before God and allow him to search your heart. I could say that in the flesh a lot more boldly. I could say it a lot more aggressively. But when we allow God to truly search our heart, that's when God can truly begin to work. Well, let's move forward quickly in these next two. Secondly, the world blinds us through the flesh. You know, sin is, and we see this in this text, we see the nature of the pride among the Pharisees. They're they're so prideful uh, and and arrogant, and when when Jesus comes and does this tremendous healing, you can see they're trying to protect this system. The sins of the flesh dull our spiritual comprehension. 1 Timothy 4.2 says this, speaks of those whose conscience is seared with a hot iron. Now listen to this. Your conscience is a part of your spirit. Your spirit is what connects you to God. Think of that. When our conscience is seared with a hot iron, the part of our being that connects us to God is totally unable to comprehend the things of God. Now, habitual sin as it takes over and it begins to work again, it has this really dulling effect, this inability to have any spiritual sensitivity whatsoever. And sensual things tend to, and I want you to think of this, think of the senses. Okay, the five senses, that, that's, the out, that's the very outer core of our being, okay? 
If you are a sensual person, anything that you're receiving is not getting outside the outer core of your being. You're so callous, you're seared with a hot iron, is inability to bring those things into the soul. I want to say this. If God is speaking to you today, wanting to speak to your spirit, wanting to draw closer in that relationship with you, want to touch your soul, want to touch your heart, and you're unable to let the message go by the outer core. You're not even taking things. I mean, you can read something, and it stops at the eye. You know, you can hear something, it stops the ear. Nothing is penetrating your spirit. Ask God for his grace and his mercy. Ask God for his grace and his mercy. But you're not able to take those things into your very soul, into your very being. And I want to say this very carefully. Until you drop the pride and until true repentance starts to take place, until the person says, God, i got to change. The moment that it begins to dawn on your mind, on your soul, on your conscience, that all these things, all these problems, yeah, there are other people who have problems. Clearly, we all have problems. We all are sinners. But ultimately, the problems that I have are my problems, and they're alienating me from a holy, almighty God. What a miserable state that is to be in. Not to be hearing from God. As Andrew often says, you were made for so much more than this. But that preoccupation with the world. You know, on times that we face such as this, especially the havoc that is being brought into South Florida, and we pray for those people. We pray that God would protect life, we pray that God will protect property. But let me say this. As the scripture says, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Is any amount of money worth my soul? In fact, the illusion of material things is you're trying to keep something that you're going to lose anyway. I promise you, if the Lord tarries 50 years from now, I won't own anything on earth because I'll be gone. Honestly, more likely as Jesus is coming back, I think it'll be gone. So what is the point of it all? Matthew 6.24 says, A man cannot serve two masters. Now, let me just say something. It might cut to the heart of the church. These Pharisees, they weren't in particularly worshiping wealth. That would actually have been the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the nation of Israel, the ones that ran the temple. They were worshiping money. They were trying to get the money and get rich. The Pharisees, that wasn't really their their God. That wasn't really their problem. And I want you to listen because this is such an amazing reality. The Pharisees were not worshiping money. They were worshiping religion instead of worshiping God. Now, that's a scary thought, isn't it? That is a real scary thought for those of us in the church. Now, clearly there has to be order. Clearly there has to be structure. In other words, chaos ensues, and God is a God of order. But it's ironic They could not see Jesus. He walked in their midst. They accused Jesus of having the spirit of the Antichrist, which means that the Antichrist spirit was really on them. They were dominated by the spirit of the Antichrist, and they're more religious than any of us here today. Blinded by the flesh. Let's go to our last point, and that is this. Let's blind the eyes. Now, now we're getting to the outer core of the eye gate, you know, the things that come into us. And, and clearly we talked about these things to some extent the last couple of weeks. But as you really kind of think about what we perceive with our eyes, um, go back and let's read verses 16 and 17 here, and that's the only two that I want to read. Read these words. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Okay. 
And others were saying, how can a man who was a sinner perform such signs? So there was a division among them. And let me just say something. One thing we know, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God never divides. The Spirit of God is always bringing unification. That's the, the first hint that you've got an issue here. So I said to the blind man, what do you say since he opened your eyes? And he said he's a prophet. And of course, all that ensues from that. But let me say this. When you lose sight, and I'm, I'm clearly talking about spiritual sight here, I think there are about three things that you clearly lose sight of. First of all, when you lose spiritual sight, you lose vision of who God is. Again, I want to go back and say this. Every person has a God, and I want you to ask you yourself right now, who is my God? What is my God? But not only do you lose sight of, of who God is, but you lose sight of the function of God. Now think, think of that. Think of my function in the sight of God. What is my function? What is my job in the sight of God? Is it not number one to have a relationship with Jesus Christ? That is my number one function. And closely following that number one function, we can talk about a lot of different things, but is it not to bring people to the person of Jesus Christ? That is the ultimate function. That is the ultimate goal. Let me just say something about this in the world today. I think one of the things that we see taking place in the church today, one of the grave errors of the church today, is to think that we can bring people into a relationship with God without upholding the holiness of God. God is holy. God is righteous. And I want to say something about the church today. It's not just simply about bringing numbers in the church. It's about a transformation of God's spirit that takes over. Loss of the function. Now, the loss of the function of the Pharisees was they're kicking this man out of the synagogue. He's, in fact, he's getting ready to get kicked out of the synagogue. Let me just say this. That was the best thing that ever happened to him. Let me just say this. On a day like today, we come to church. We're not going to be at church this evening. Let me tell you when you're thinking religiously and you're looking at things religiously, and so to spiritually. If your mind is saying, yay, I don't have to go to church tonight. I don't have to feel guilty about it. Then you're thinking religiously. The man that is thinking spiritual is thinking this. You know, as much as I would love to be in corporate worship this evening, I get to concentrate on the living God myself. God has given me this time to examine my heart. No one else is looking. No one else is watching. I get a chance to hear from God. I want to say something very important. As a pastor, as a preacher, you wouldn't expect me to say, don't come to church, and I won't, because I want people to be at church, clearly. And the scripture clearly says that. But let me say this. As important as corporate worship is, I truly believe what I'm about to say to be the absolute truth, that individual worship is more important than corporate worship. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I know that, that when God really speaks to me, and I realize I'm a pastor, I do a lot of preaching, and it's my job in a sense. But when God reveals something to me, out of his word that I study or I read or some, that I get through a commentary or something, God's spirit speaks to me and shows me something, I want to say this. The deepest, deepest things I've ever received have come from God speaking to me individually. I want to say this. This could be taken as prideful. And you know, our pride is a funny thing because when somebody first, this comment was first made to me, I was tempted to respond in a prideful way, but I thought about this comment a long time. When I was in Israel in 2004, we went somewhere and I, I comment, commented on something um, up in Bashan in the northern region. At any rate, it was, had to do with an archaeological site. And a young man who was, uh, actually I think he was, might have been working on a graduate degree, he might have been a graduate degree, I'm not really sure. But he said, 
well, where'd you learn that from? And I told him about reading the scriptures and doing that. He said, you, you found all that out sitting, just reading and studying and kind of going through it? And you know, we got to be careful about pride. Because the first thing that Satan said is, gee, you know more than these guys. But then I thought about that, and I kind of thought, you know, that's really not a good attitude. But then after I thought about that and said, you know, I really need to repent of that attitude, then I got another message. And God said, most of what I give you comes when you're seeking me. Now think of that. Most of what I get from God comes when I'm seeking him. Think of that. Are you seeking God today? There's a loss of the vision in sight of who God is. There's a loss of the function of God. But also perhaps the saddest sight that is lost, and I close with this, is the loss of the intimacy of God. Think of that. We're so involved in church. And it's, it's really hard for somebody like me because, you know, I, Everything that we do, I'm focused on church and everything like that. Um, and there's a lot of the responsibility that we have with that. But when you lose sight of the intimacy of God, Andrew one time made the comment coming back from seminary, seminary is the worst place to be for your spiritual growth. <laughs> and it is, it is funny that, that here you are spending all this time learning to be a pastor, and sometimes you can forget about how to be a child of God. Now think of that. Now the Pharisees carried that to an utter extreme, did they not? That is not the example that we want to follow. Christianity, Jesus, was never about religion, but it was ultimately about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Lust blinds the eyes. The flesh blinds my being, and pride blinds my soul. And with that, Satan has got you. If God's Spirit is speaking to your heart,